we're not going to make it. If I hadn't got the concept working, then I think the film would have failed because he would have said no one would have watched it. No way, mister. You're going to the top of this mountain. Broken legs and all. It was pretty exciting because, first of all, I always really admired Peter. You're crazy, you know that? You know, the Truman Show was... was fantastic. Yeah, tell me something I don't know. Somehow it feels like it has a particular place in the library. Every decade there's a couple of films that sort of hold up and capture the time they were made and sort of have a timeless quality about them. All right, promise me one thing, though. If I die before I reach the summit, you'll use me as an alternative source of food. Peter saw, he, he saw in, in Jim something that none of us had seen. It's unbelievable how quickly the real world caught up to this cynical, dark fantasy Andrew Nichol had 10 years ago. Good morning. Morning. Good morning. Oh, and in case I don't see you, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. <laughs> it was so complete. It was um, like putting someone else's clothes on. And uh, I thought, uh, who is this Andrew Nichol? You know, this is different. This is, this is a writer. Uh, and a writer who's writing something that he knows about. It's absolutely Andrew's script, and Andrew was very much a part of the concept. He was able to focus in on it and, and discover something that was unique about it, and that's what Peter discovered as well. He discovered the uniqueness. I think the, the, the prophetic kind of aspect of, um, of this piece um, came, comes from Andrew Nichol, and it's reflected in some of the other films he's made, like Gattaca. Um, and, and I pay um, him the compliment of, of, uh, of the originality of that point of view of the world. That's Andrew's thumbprint. The Truman Show is really not such a far out concept right now. And we used to laugh, we used to make jokes about, re you know, what now is going to happen with reality, t with reality TV, which wasn't even uh, an expression then. And lo and behold, it's done that and gone beyond it. Yeah, pre you know, it predated all that stuff, yeah. Unfortunately, it kind of, it rang true. That's why I say I admired it in a, and, and um, admired Andrew's writing. And it was kind of perfect for what it was, but it wasn't right for me. It's an odd thing, and the only time I've ever had something that I, that I did admire, but wanted to change if I did it. And that fundamentally came down to one major sticking point for me. For me, Andrew's draft was like a brilliant speculative um, uh, science fiction, almost. The script had been originally written and it was set in New York City. It was a very different tone, a very different film. If I looked at it as a movie, I thought it had to be light where he had it dark. I wanted to make it real, not science fiction. I wanted to make it just the near future, if you like, which of course it turned out to be, not that we knew that. Peter was predicting what the future holds for us, that we were taking the next step into uh, a controlled uh, environment. And to do that, I thought, well, why would people watch it 24-7? It has to be not depressing, which, which it would be. It has to be um, kind of um, enlivening. That'd be all for you, Truman. That's the whole kit and caboodle. Catch you, ladies. <laughs> it has to be therapeutic and sort of um, you know, have a certain charm, a certain sort of relaxing quality to it. So that depended on the star, naturally. Good morning, Truman. Good morning, Truman. Hey, how are you guys? Beautiful day, isn't oh, it? Always. I think he was attracted by the basic idea, and I think he had an enormous respect for Jim Carrey's talent. And the thought of doing a picture with Jim Carrey, I think, really, and, and to bring out a new dimension in Carrey, really was a challenge to him. And two, I thought it should be in a sort of holiday resort, a sort of, uh, you know, the ideal place. People always, you know, look at holiday brochures or they have screensavers with fish on them and tropical lagoons, you know. So I thought it should be in a place like that, a dream haven, uh, and always be sunny, you know, and uh, except when, <laughs> when they wanted to make it rain. Uh, so therefore it would be more entertaining. Uh, and so I needed Jim and I needed to rejig the script with Andrew to get it to suit this concept. I was sort of proud of Jim for wanting to, 
take a leap and grow. I mean, when you have someone who is profoundly talented, and Jim is a geyser of talent, um, when you see them be brave enough to step outside of what they're comfortable in, you know, they deserve all the support that they can get. And knowing that Peter had worked with Robin Williams before, you know, Jim could not have been in better hands. Well, when I saw Ace Ventura, you know, pretty clearly he was a star. And he had a particular kind of energy. If I can quote Charlie Chaplin, you know, when he was asked, what do you think it is? I know it's a corny question, Charlie, but why do you think the world loves you? And he said, oh, that's an easy question to answer. I offer them charm and energy, the two things they most lack. And Jim has those qualities. And uh, he was ambitious, which is interesting. He was ready for a change. He was ready to try something to break out of the mold of uh, basically a very young audience, which is what he had. And um, this was perfect material. He realized that for him, because he could you know, keep one foot in a way in the comedy area and at the same time um, develop a more realistic character. I was really kind of nervous about working with someone like Peter Weir because I, I thought he would have such granite, written in stone ideas about, uh, you know, about uh, what he wanted to do. You know, he would come down from the mountain and go, these are the laws, let go, you know, whatever, <laughs> whatever he was going to do, you know, pull a Moses on me. but. Uh, but he didn't. He was he was very like, come on, let's uh, let's scratch this out together. You know, let's figure it out. You know, many comics, people who basically do comedy, are really strange, and uh, many of them are self-loathing. He's not. Uh, he is a very sensitive and understand. He put himself completely in the hands of Peter Weir. And after all, he had had tremendous success doing bizarre comedies. This was his chance to move into the uh, dramatic world. So this was a big risk uh, that Paramount took and that Peter took, and that, you know, it wasn't it wasn't an obvious choice. Having said yes to uh, this project in '95, with a script in pretty good shape, it seemed uh, Jim wasn't available for a year, and he was just booked up. Well, that was a great. Um, accidental happen, happening because we really worked hard uh, to get the script into the shape that I finally um, I shot and we did you know 16 drafts or something and were able to explore all kinds of avenues. I wanted the logic of the piece um, absolutely watertight. I wanted to have thought of every question that an audience might ask because I knew that if we didn't answer them even in small details uh, then it would open a crack in the piece and it would say it couldn't happen. And that's what those exhaustive drafts did, you know, and that, that, that therefore when you watch the film, um, pretty much everything is covered so that you suspend disbelief as you have to do in a film. And you, um, and you believe this could happen. And at the same time, I, I did things like I wrote a background to Christoph. I said to Andrew, do you mind? I, I'm gonna really invent this guy's background for myself. And uh, so I wrote a 10-page piece about him and where he came from and documentary background. And, uh, you know, he'd won an Academy Award for a piece he'd done on the homeless in which he'd uh, put some cameras in a kind of uh, crash pad and, you know, filmed homeless people. And that, you know, made it plausible. And initially the Truman Show was only to be about a baby. And uh, they were going to do one year of its life, which seemed more logical, and sell baby products. So they only built a nursery and they hired a mum. Uh, and you know, they would, you would see the kind of uh, products for sale there, you know, the powders and, and oils and things for the baby and baby food. It was so successful, they decided to add a father to it, so they built a garage. And so the father could come and go <laughs> from the nursery to the garage, and in there would be, you know, his car and the rakes and tools and, you know. And so they developed a little husband and wife story going and went for another year. And then Christoph presented them with the big plan, which was to go from cradle to grave, a whole life, and build not just a house, but a town. And then I, you know, I went to the details of how he raised finance, you know, I had advisors telling me how you would do this and get money from here. The Japanese loved the idea right off. And, you know, so I'm, I was making it plausible for myself. Peter has a way of taking a little back. 
He doesn't try to sell you all at one time. He tries to do it in bits and pieces. And as a result, he gets a lot of uh, big results. You know, it's a story that you, it, you've got to believe it. He wrote an enormous amount for all of us. And the thing that was the most helpful to me was not only Peter, but his wife, Wendy Stites, who was a genius. They gave me a catalog, a Sears and Roebuck catalog from the 1940s. And so all the physical movements are sort of based on those, those silhouettes from those models. Um, and so we worked a lot on the physicality, and, and I, just, I can just remember talking to Peter and just, just laughing. I mean, the two of us just laughing as we came up with one sort of more wild characteristic about this person. So it was, uh, you know, it was just a joy. It really was. I remember he gave that to me, he gave me the backstory on paper. It was very helpful, yeah. And then you, you know, fill in blanks for yourself. Uh, the more information he had, he had some images, I think, of things that he showed me. Because the more, the more stuff he could give me in a, in a, in a short period of time was, was helpful to me. Well, I always, I mean, I created my own personal sort of backstory on, on Lewis, you know, uh, on this kid who obviously he'd been on the show, on the Truman Show in the, in, the, in the movie for his whole life with Truman grown up together. So you have to imagine that this kid had some very pushy stage mother who was willing to sell her son into this unreality, you know, and sacrifice his childhood for the sake of becoming a television personality. So there's that element to this guy who was an aspiring child actor. And then there's the other reality, which was that he actually did grow up with Truman on The Truman Show, and they became best friends. That was an authentic, I think, real relationship. Because when you're eight years old, you're not faking your best friend. And sort of, you know, the notion that you're with someone all your life that you can't actually share the secret with. Must have been very, very difficult for, for, for Lewis, you know, to have this burden as a child. Um, so I think that creates a very interesting sort of almost psychotic split in, the, in this character who has to be false perpetually to the person who is authentically probably his best friend in the world. And then he, of course, grows up and realizes he's this famous actor but it's all predicated upon this very deep and profound betrayal, false life that I think must have made him a very complicated uh, man. I worked on Hannah Gill first, who she was and what she was doing there. Doesn't she look beautiful, truly? Mm. Well, she still does. What kind of an actress was she? What were her motivations? What was her agenda? What was her personality? And then worked on Meryl second. So you're, so you're an actress playing an actress who's playing a character in a reality TV show, basically. And it was just great fun. I mean, we came up with endless amounts of backstory for each of our characters. I need to talk to you, but uh, let's go outside. Oh, sweet. I'd love to, but I'm really late. And all of this was with Peter's guidance, and hence he would sort of like throw you a diamond of, of an idea, and you'd just run with it. She was a rabidly ambitious, powerful woman who, when not on the set, my idea was that she had this huge room with an enormous conference table, and she was just making deals left, right, and center, and making an enormous amount of money. Uh, that she had gained so much popularity through the show that she had an enormous amount of power. For example, every time she slept with, with Truman, she'd get a bump in salary. Come to bed. Every time she would do a product placement that was successful, she'd get a bump in salary. So she was constantly wheeling and dealing. Get one of those new elk rotaries. You know, it was fun. It was just fun to think about that. And then to layer on top of it someone who's supposed to be caring and sweet and lovely and, you know, <laughs> it was fun. Everybody's a little bit more complicated than they seem at first if you really dig into the sort of backstory of these characters. I came into it, with, of course, slightly apprehensive, or I guess intimidated, of this incredible energy, this comic sort of force that existed. And I thought, wow, how is he going to do this dramatic role? I and mean, I was myself didn't see it so clearly or know how it worked. I think the big misconception with a lot of comedians is that they're constantly on all the time. And while I'm sure there are a few, these people work very, very hard. I mean, Jim Carrey works extremely hard. He comes up with idea after idea after idea after idea. 
right from the minute we met, we, we, we couldn't stop talking, you know, about the potential of it because it was um, extremely provocative material, you know, because you could invent things right off, you know, and I came in and I said, oh, I was thinking, you know, when I came from the hotel, got up this morning, I was cleaning my teeth like you do in the mirror, you know, and I think, you know, it'd be interesting, we could put a scene in with you doing stuff in the mirror, and he, he got all excited about that, and the next time I came to see him, I think he'd written stuff out on the mirror, you know, uh, in soap, you know, and had invented all this stuff like he was this astronaut and whatever. The whole uh, Trumania thing is, uh, you know, came from me uh, in my own bathroom drawing faces on the mirror and sticking my face into them like they're little soap masks, you know, and sometimes I would do a whole bodysuit or a you know, big frilly dress or something like with a wig and then put myself into it. No, oh, darling, whatever it is, you know. And I hereby proclaim this planet. Trumania. So we had this report, because I'd begun in sketch comedy uh, at university and um, had done reviews and even television shows uh, in a kind of Monty Python way. So I had that background as his was stand-up, but certainly, you know, we had that kind of what if, what if, what if, what if kind of uh, rapport. He just made me very creative because I was not afraid to bring things to him. You know, once you get past that, when you know somebody's going to, you know, listen to your ideas at least and not go, oh, God, he's got another idea. You know, that kind of thing. It's, you know, Peter welcomed creativity on every level. He was very passionate and committed and dedicated to doing as good a job as he could do. There was very little sort of ego or star behavior. It was really, I mean, his attitude at the time was really like, hey, I'm in new water here. You guys are all dramatic actors. This is my first time, so help me out. I mean, it wasn't at all sort of condescending or, or star-like, so that was wonderful. He was sweet and he was kind and he was, um you know, in foreign territory, and I'm, I'm sure a little scared at times. Come on, come on, come on. I told you I can't. You're gonna get both their asses fired, you know that. <laughs> okay, man, let's do it. There's a rainbow, and I, you know, normally do, you know, red, uh, green, and you know, yellow, or something like that, and now I've got some purples and some, you know, whatever in there. You know, I just, it's just completing the rainbow, that's all. I mean, we're all a full rainbow of emotions and things like that. Anybody who comes out here and says, I just joke around, I'm not affected by feelings, is a, you know, a liar. And uh, so uh, I guess that's the great thing about this project for me is I get to show the other colors. And people talk about acting as being reacting, and he gives you a lot to react to, so it makes your job pretty easy. Uh, and I, I was also sort of amazed at how talented and good he was dramatically. I have never seen him like that. Another beautiful day in paradise, folks. But don't forget to buckle up out there in Radio Land. Remember, good driver. Good, 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 good. The key for this movie was um, was finding, you know, first of all, what it was going to look like. What, what what is this community? How had it evolved, and what was it going to uh, uh, represent um, in the time period of Truman's life? They were looking for a, a location in, in in on the east coast of Florida, and then we got a. Uh, well, we were told by Peter Weir's wife, Wendy, that in, there's a place up in Seaside that she had read about in Architectural Digest, and that, that Peter should take a look at it. Initially, my plan had been to use a back lot, and I toured all the existing back lots, or the remains of them in uh, Los Angeles, and thought using principally universals, we could put it together and build some material. And that, in fact, that's what they'd done. They had uh, used a, you know, bought, imagine they could, Universal's backlot and made it the Truman Show setting. But it was wrong in another a number of ways. You know, it was expensive to hire. It was also composed of bits of France and, and Western Street and all of that, a um, bit of downtown. But I thought I might use that. At one point it was going to be that, you know, Truman would have grown up with a Western Street and with a bit of Paris and a bit of uh, uh, Manhattan. Um, but we also went to look at 
then uh, extreme project house type locations where it would be, which was the first draft, was much more like a cookie cutter houses, you know, so you're living in a kind of, um, you know, sort of futuristic horror of uh, urban planning. And there's plenty of examples of that. Um, and then I was tipped off about a little town in Florida that had been built um, on the principles of the best vernacular uh, from uh, the south of the United States, a town called Seaside, and I saw some photographs. So we began a survey that, that um, finally brought us to Seaside. And once he took a look at it, it was like some, a dream, because Seaside is a set. It's a uh, 90 acres on the beach, with uh, about 400 houses, all of whom were built at the three-quarter scale. They all had widow walks. You couldn't have on the same street, you had to have a, a fence, but you couldn't have the same fence on the same street with another house. Uh, you also had to have a porch, and the place became almost, I thought it was a set. I said, unpack our bags. We're not leaving. This is it. How do we get it? And we did unpack, and we did stay, and we never went anywhere else. And pre-production virtually began, but it became an extremely complex and difficult negotiation with the founder of the town, Robert Davis. And Seaside didn't want to let us shoot there. Uh, and uh, they, you know, they're basically very wealthy people. And what do they want a movies company around running through their streets? And I finally uh, told the guy, well, he first asked me for $5 million to shoot there. Well, I couldn't have $5 million, so I couldn't do that. So I said, look, I'll tell you what, you don't seem to understand theatrical business, the movie business. You pick out a lawyer, and I will pay for him so that you get the advice you should get. And without his um, backing, we wouldn't have been able to do it. Fortunately, it all worked out. But uh, there were tense moments where, where the studio was saying, come on, look, we'll just go and choose another town. You know, there are other towns. And I said, this, this is unique. Um, uh, Disney, in fact, were at that time copying it. And they did uh, create their own uh, town of celebration not far away. And, and they did go the full way. You know, they, they really made a kind of uh, fantasy town. But um, Seaside's a real town. Real people come and go, and you know, they love it. Uh, but it was uh, a key player in the film, and I think without it, the film would be um, less effective. And uh, we were able to, to, to create that closed-in feeling because of it. We, the only building we did, really, was built some of the... Uh, added on for the, his office. We added on to an existing building. I had some interesting reactions from people, you know, that, um, you know, some would say, um, oh my God, that ghastly candy floss town, you know, and it was so hideous. Coming from New York City, uh, where I grew up, and sort of, it has a very odd sort of big brother feeling to it on some level. Morning! Good morning! Good morning! And then others would say, I would really love to live there. Is it, a, did you build it? Or, and I said, no, it's a real town in Florida. And they said, oh, I'd love to go there and be there. I loved it. I mean, I just, I had a wonderful time. Um, there were a lot of people on the, on the set and the crew that the town sort of creeped them out a little bit. I don't know if that was the residue of, of our doing the movie or just a, a pre-planned community, if that made them uncomfortable. And they kept saying, denial. Everyone who lives here must be in denial. And I was like, I'll take denial. We were stuck in this little, uh you know, panhandle uh, creation of a town that this, uh, you know, that the, the, uh, the draftsman just came in and went, Pfft! you know, <laughs> and it's just from another world. It's just like, looked like it dropped from, uh, you know, off a, a Norman Rockwell painting. Which only proved that the concept of the show worked. It is sort of like a set. I mean, it was our set. It looks like a set, but it's, it's not. It seemed realistic enough that if in fact you were a, a child that had grown up, you know, uh, without any other knowledge other than what is presented to you, um, it would be believable. You know, we all lived, I lived and I said Laura on the set of the movie. The houses that we lived in were, were, were actually 
picture houses, you know. So I would, I actually got a phone call one day. I was in my day off and I was in my living room in my bathrobe and I get a phone call saying, Noah, get out of the room, you're in the shot, you're in the shot. Because they were shooting down the street and like, I guess I wasn't, I mean, you could see me walking by back and forth in the window. That's how integrated it was, this sort of fantasy reality, Truman Show, TV, not TV, you know, film, not, it really became this phenomenal blur of uh, cross between storytelling and living, you know, sort of every actor's dream to, to live on the set, to live in the costume, in the character, and we sort of did that. There you go, sir. Both Peter Weir and I had been thinking quite conventionally when we first spent two weeks deciding on where and how we would shoot this in dissecting the city of Seaside and, and, and elaborating on how we were going to conceive this film. And um, Peter Bijou came and said, well, you know, the camera positions uh, should be um, like this and like this and like this. It kind of hit us in the strangest way because we were saying you were so absolutely right. Because we were so focused on the design of the, the movie. When Peter Bijou came, the missing link came, and it was absolutely a wonderful moment. I remember it uh, so specifically where we all just kind of came together, you know, with story director and design and cinematography. It all became one whole at that point, and it was, a, it was a wonderful experience. I was blessed with Peter Bijou, a cinematographer of great experience, and I admired his work for ages, and, and we enjoyed, from the minute we sat down, talking about how to photograph it. And uh, his background is, um, you know, extremely knowledgeable through the work of his father, who was, um, you know, very involved in lens making and camera building. And so he came up with fantastic ideas. He went and talked to his dad, as a matter of fact. But I'd always loved silent films, you know, where they kind of, um, you know, irised in or they had a gobo effect. Uh, because the frame's arbitrary. You know, we just settle on that framing. It could be anything. The frame could be looked like that, you know. Uh, it could be, could be like that. It depends, you know, it's, it's just what you want. So I enjoyed playing with the frame as a result of what was interfering with the shot, um, as a result of it being concealed. And, uh, you know, it enabled us to give the film a particular look. You know, there's no, practically no tracking shots, uh, logically. Um, cameras are handheld inside baskets of fruit or, or briefcases, people walk around with them, and that was reflected. Um, and, you know, it was a lot of zooms, but, um, and a lot of static lenses. And some of the framing needed to be off. And occasionally we would make an awkward framing as a result of um, not ideal camera placement. See, this isn't about insurance. This is about the great variable. One of the biggest challenges, I think, for Peter in editing and structuring the movie was using those goboed views of Truman and views through pencil sharpeners, through compasses, through clocks or whatever else, through the, through the car radio, as little clues to the audience that something was up in his world. And a lot of those shots that just maybe have the, the dark vignette around the lens, a lot of those were done just in camera. Peter Bijou would just, you know, put something in the matte box. And that worked out really well if Peter actually knew that he wanted that on a particular shot. But as he cut the movie together and he would just restructure the movie back and forth all kinds of different ways, it turns out that shots that he thought he wanted clean now became important to have a vignette on it because of where it appeared structurally in the film. It was terribly tempting. It was a very dangerous road to go down because it was for a filmmaker and for a DOP, it was very exciting. We can do this and we could do this weird effect, you know. Uh, and we did do some of them, you know, camera and a pencil sharpener and stuff like that. But if you go too far with it, you know, it would be distracting. Come with us now as we go live to the Lunar Room on the 221st floor of the Omnicam Ecosphere. That's where we'll find the world's greatest televisionary, the designer and architect of the world within a world that is Sea Haven Island, Crystal. Peter is very loath to ever tell an actor goodbye. I mean, he's, uh, he's a very moral person. Uh, there was another actor hired, and of course, you know, the, uh, this actor is a pretty good actor. I mean, he's a famous, he's had a great career. And it wasn't working out. And uh, finally, we just had to make arrangements to uh, get another actor. Now I didn't have an actor. Well, Christoph was, uh, was, was probably the only, in this brilliant script of Andrews, the only weak link. I had, I had not got it by the time the picture started. 
Uh, it would always work, but it wasn't what is now in the film. And that caused me to have to make a casting change because the Christoph was not going to be shot until the end of the movie. The whole Christoph section was shot at the last, the end of the picture at Paramount. He never appeared in, in uh, Seaside. So there was another you know, two, three months before we reached that point, and I had time still to be thinking about it. And by the time we got to the point, or close to the point of shooting, I realized I needed a different kind of actor. We didn't have an actor that Peter would take. And Peter's not someone you can say, use Sam Smith. He has to want the actor. And first he said to me, can you get me an English actor who doesn't sound English? I said, how about an American actor who doesn't sound English? Uh, and he laughs at those things. And uh, we try to get actors. Uh, some actors passed the picture. They were busy doing shows in, on their own, and they weren't, you know, they didn't realize what the part meant. And we were at a point, we were in a stalemate with the studio. And I believe that at one point, it was a Thursday, when I'm sitting in my office feeling sorry for myself. Because on the following Tuesday, I had to close the picture down if I didn't have Christoph. So who to get to play it? And I'm sitting in my office, and I get a call from, uh, I believe, one of the agencies, the CAA. Are you guys interested in Ed Harris? And I jumped out of my chair. And I said, listen, we're shooting in Trancas tonight. He lives near there. Get him in his truck and have him come over the set. I want him to meet Peter Weir. I think they sent over a script to me, like, immediately. I read it, got in my truck, and drove up to the beach and met Peter in, a, in his trailer or something. And we talked for a while. He said he really wanted me to play this role. I talk with him just as we're sitting, you know, and I said, I, 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 he said, tell me as much as you can. I said, I can show you dailies and, and, and little cuts and talked about Christoph. Peter hires him before we can make a deal with CAA. You're hired. I want you. And puts him in, in wardrobe and in makeup before we hired him. I think this was a, might have been a Thursday or, or something. And I was supposed to start filming on uh, Tuesday or something. I don't know how he did it, because I think it was a Friday or something I met him. We had to start shooting on a Monday or Tuesday, these sequences. And I didn't know until we, I got a phone call that, we would, that he'd take it up in this short time. Yeah, it kind of blew my mind. I mean, particularly, I mean, you know, I was reading it the first time with playing Kristoff in mind, and I was going, whoa. You know, how, how are you supposed to do this? How are you supposed to pull this guy off in terms of it, him being kind of, you know, obviously this godlike figure? And uh, so that was, it was, it, it was challenging, especially to kind of come up with something in a couple of days that felt organic and justified, you know. I think it actually was kind of um, a blessing in disguise to not have time to work on it or prepare or anything because it, it had to be somewhat instinctive and intuitive and you know it's the kind of thing you could kind of over over prepare for. I remember the stories from the wardrobe department he's trying to work out how to do this character at short notice you know and he said at the wardrobe meeting he said maybe I should have a hunchback. I was thinking like why what what kind of character what individual would end up doing something like this you know and so my feeling was perhaps you know I'm going back like you know, Freudian things, you know, I'm thinking, well, maybe if he was, had a very unpleasant childhood, you know, really grew up taunted, uh, troubled, that he wanted to create this idyllic world for, for another child. So I said, what if he had like a hunchback, you know, what if he had, what if, what if he had like a, just a, not a huge grotesque thing, but like a hump on his back, you know, and Wendy actually, got this thing, they made this thing for me, you know, to try on. I mean, Peter goes, I don't think so, Ed, but you know, you can try it if you want, you know. So she actually made this padded thing, you know, and put it on, put the jacket on, and <laughs> it's like, that. let's not do that. But, you know, I was just trying to think of stuff. By the time we hit the deck on, on the day of shooting, you know, not, not, you know, a few days later, he had that character. 
and uh, I'm eternally grateful to him for it. And, um, and was fascinated to watch him work. Yeah. Scenes had been re rewritten somewhat and tailored for the new concept of Christoph. Um, and and he he did a he did a, a brilliant job. I mean, I could, I kind of rather fascinating to watch him. You know, if you know Peter, he's such a thorough, great director. So yeah, if you were going to do something like that, so quickly like that, uh, to be under his guidance, it was uh, it was pretty special. He gave a rounded character, and that's difficult to do with um, with a villain and with very you know a Hollywood movie. Um, there's a kind of well-worn track that people accept. Uh, and so occasionally you get this kind of uh, rare performer who can, uh, uh, beyond the screenplay, can flesh out a, a rounded character. And that character therefore will carry, as we all do, um, uh, inconsistencies in their nature. And um, not contradictions, but inconsistencies. And that's what he does demonstrate and therefore creates a believable human being. You know, Ed's, Ed's really a genius. He has uh, unbelievable power and, and had, a, had a real wonderful duality of his sincere love and sense of bond, you know, the bond that he had with Truman, and then at the same time a sort of, you know, inflated ego, maniacal, powerful uh, undercurrent, you know, and the, and the two of those things together I think were made that dynamic really interesting. The uh, producer Scott Rudin said to me that the reason he bought the uh, script was essentially that passage, literally a rite of passage, on that little ship sailing across a fake ocean and hitting a fake sky. And he said, he said he was very moved by it. And I, and I said, it for me too, I think, as I read the piece, was uh, what completely enveloped me. It can be, it's surprising emotion in a piece that's really rather um, cool in a way. You know, it's energetic, but it's, uh, it's a very hard and cold look uh, at a world. And the, and the audience. The audience never believed that was a, a psych. You know, that's real. That's real to them. The sky was real and he's suddenly punching a hole in the sky. And surprisingly comes this emotion and you, and, and you, you pulled into, um, into feeling for him, as are the audiences of the Truman Show television show. So a critical moment, but it was, um, that was there from the first draft of Andrews. I think the choice that Peter and Jim made to play that whole sequence on, on Jim's back after he hits the wall is really, like, it's the quintessential example of the power of Peter Weir as a director because it would have been tempting to assume that you need to see a character's face in order to communicate that emotion. But, but Peter made such a bold choice to let the body language and the soundtrack and, and just the composition of, you know, the boat that, that represented his freedom juxtaposed against the wall that is just this unforeseen trap. And Jim's body English just tells the whole story. And then when he turns around, I cry every time I see that. He turns around and you see the anguish on his face. And that first glimpse of Jim's face is so much more powerful for having you know, watched him have his private grief on his back first. It was a really good movie, good film. Which didn't surprise me. I mean, you know, Peter doesn't make films that don't work. I think The Truman Show, you know, is relevant. That's one of the amazing things about it. It really is a relevant conversation today. That's, in fact, if not more relevant than it was eight years ago. It was definitely ahead of its time. And I think we sort of had a sense of that even when we were making it. It's all about Peter Wood, as far as I'm concerned. You know, it, it, in, in the best possible world, every single actor would have the opportunity to work with him. <laughs> I sort of wish that experience for everybody. He engenders, I don't know if that's the right word, loyalty. I mean, you really feel like you want to do your best thing, best work for the guy because he cares and he's good. Who would turn down this kind of a project? Jim Carrey and Peter Weir? I mean, it's terrific. You know, you can't really ask for more. I remember saying to Peter at the, when we were nearing the end of principal photography, I said, Peter, you know, you've ruined me. You've ruined me. How am I going to match this? How am I going to repeat this? And, it, and, you know, it's incredibly rare, 
experience. Again, you know, Peter was, uh, was so brilliant in putting it all together. It was just terrific to collaborate with him on it and, and, uh, um, and have him actually uh, find the project, you know, which uh, I, I talked to a lot of other directors who'd read it and, and couldn't figure it out or couldn't quite understand what it was going to be like. And, and, uh, and I was glad that it settled with Peter. One question was, was it too early? to bring this movie out? Was, the, was it a relevant enough conversation or did it seem too outlandish? I mean, when you look at all the reality TV that's going on now and you think about when The Truman Show came out, I think if, if we had known, <laughs> we'd all be horrified, maybe. This was a, a dangerous film to make because it couldn't happen. How ironic. It was definitely on the forefront of, its, of the cultural sort of wave of addressing these issues.